Okay. Um, Dr. Nish is the medical director of the John Stoddard, Stoddard Cancer Center in Des Moines, and his passion is to educate the public and healthcare workers about true health and well being and how this can be achieved through lifestyle changes, including food and nutrition, stress management, sleep, exercise, purpose in life, and social relationships. So, all of the non medical parts. So, we're excited about that. He is um, especially fascinated with the mind body connection and how our thoughts and beliefs directly influence our physical and mental health. And we've been waiting um, for this presentation, Dr. Nish. So, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. And wow, it's everything I'm not going to talk about tonight, right? Oh. <laughs> Well, I think so, the title of today's presentation was Nutrition Doesn't Have to Be Complicated. And I yeah. think that a lot of times we do all spin out on, am I eating the right thing? And what is the exact right diet I need to follow to, to have optimal health? And, and you kind of hinted that it doesn't have to be as complicated as all of that. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I really appreciate you inviting me to this because you know, people get over, you know, people are overwhelmed when they have a diagnosis of cancer, and then they're overwhelmed with their treatment, and then they get all this conflicting food advice. And, um, you know, I, I really want to simplify it. And the way I'm going to simplify it is, and I don't know what everyone expected, like, did you expect me to give you a whole list of foods to eat this, not that, because I didn't do that. And what I really did is, I really wanted people to understand what drives disease and how our food system drives disease. And I wanted to give you the basic foundation of how do I go to the grocery store and buy things that are good for me and not just give you a list of things because I, I don't know if that does anybody any good. So I really wanna develop a foundation for you to understand where disease comes from and when I say disease, I mean cancer, I mean heart disease, I mean dementia, I mean autoimmune disease, I mean all the chronic diseases we see. And what can you do in your life from a foods aspect to minimize the disease process and help all of you with your healing? So that's how I've sort of approached this talk tonight. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully, and then I'm gonna get rid of my picture because I don't want anybody to be distracted. There we go. <clears throat> Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm going to just go ahead and put it in presentation mode. Okay. So yeah, Gabby and I spoke, oh, a few months ago and uh, kind of said, okay, what, what should the title of this be? And we kind of came up with food and nutrition. It doesn't have to be complicated. And so that's why I want to teach you the fundamentals of what I'm going to call metabolic health. And I've been reading and researching food and nutrition for over 10 years now. And, um, you know, it's becoming more and more evident that our chronic diseases in today's society are driven by metabolic dysregulation. And we're gonna define what that means so everybody understands. So Gabby, I don't have, um, if somebody has a question, will you monitor the chat for me? Yes, I will. And feel free to interrupt me because I want everybody to be crystal clear about these concepts because these concepts are so important in understanding how we should eat and why we should eat the things that are good for us and avoid the things that maybe aren't so good for us. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. And Gabby, you go ahead and interrupt me if I need to answer a question for anyone, okay? Got it. Perfect. So, First of all, let's define food. And I also want to define the word poison. So what is food? And this is directly out of the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a substance used in the body of an organism to sustain growth, repair, and vital processes, and to furnish energy. What's the definition of a poison? 
a substance that is capable of causing illness or death of a living organism. So real food, and I want, and this is, you know, we hear um, food as medicine. I'm sure you've all heard that term, but in our world, Doritos is a food. Twinkies are a food. And I want you to understand that those are not foods. Those are actually chronic long-term poison. And I will define why. So real food, things that mother nature gave us to eat, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, eggs, even animal products support growth, repair, and furnish energy. Processed foods are slow acting poisons. Back in ancient Greek times, they defined anything can be a poison, right? Water can be a poison. Water in large enough quantities can kill us. Oxygen in concentrated enough forms can kill us. So the dose, the dose determines the poison. And we are eating tremendous doses of highly processed, highly refined, highly manufactured sugar foods, sugary foods that our body was never adapted to handle. And so the dose, the poison is in the dose and we're consuming massive doses of things that we just don't know what to do with. So is all food inherently bad? No, all food in its natural form is inherently good. Every different food that's provided in mother nature has some healing or therapeutic property. It's what's been done to the food that's bad. It's what manufacturers have done to the food that has caused the food to not be so good for us. So I really want this concept, everybody to understand, it's not the food itself. So if I said, wheat is bad, well, not true. Whole wheat in its natural form, if I give you a wheat berry, with the bran on the outside, the endosperm in the middle, and the germ on the inside, in its whole, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that food. But when I grind it into a powder and call it flour and then bake pastries and bread, that's a problem. So it's been what's done to the food, either subtracting things from the natural food or the addition of substance to the food that should never have been there. And over time, our consumption of these processed, highly refined, manufactured food is toxic to our bodies. And the only antidote is real food. So we're gonna talk about metabolic dysregulation and our ability to repair. And I wanna emphasize that this is foodable and not druggable. We do not have a drug to counteract the effects of bad diets. So somebody might say, well, what about diabetes? That's from eating too much sugar and too many carbs. Well, all that insulin and diabetes meds are doing is masking the symptom. They're not treating the disease because the disease is dysregulation of our ability to handle glucose. So let's start with the biggest lie in nutrition. And that is a calorie is a calorie. And the food industry has perpetuated this for the last 50 years. They've told us that all calories from food are what are called fungible. They're interchangeable with the implication being that any calorie from any food can be part of a balanced diet as long as you don't to eat too many. Well, that is absolutely 100% propaganda marketing and is completely wrong. So we learned how to measure calories, oh, a century ago. And a calorie has nothing to do with human biology. It's actually a measure of energy. So all we're saying is that when you put um, a gram of whatever it is, carbohydrate in your mouth, you get four calories from that. Because what they did is they took that food, they burned it in what's called a bomb calorimeter and said, see, it made this many calories. Calories and uh, an energy measurement. But that has nothing to do with human biology. What we put in our mouths directly affects hormonal and metabolic responses from our body telling us to either store energy, usually as fat, 
or burn energy so that we have ener en feel energetic and move. In the scientific world, it's called substrate partitioning. So every bit of food you take in is either burned for energy to sustain metabolic processes, to sustain, sustain function of our organs, sustain movement and exercise, or it's partitioned into energy storage as fat. So I really, I really need everybody to understand that, that a calorie is not a calorie. And let me give you an example. So if you eat a serving of um, almonds, quarter cup of almonds, it says on the package that it has 160 calories. Yet we know from physiologic studies, only 130 calories are actually absorbed. What happened to those other 30 calories? Well, those other 30 calories were in the form of fiber. And that fiber is used in our gut to slow the absorption of the carbohydrates in the nuts. It's used by the bugs in our gut that we call the microbiome. So these trillions of bacteria that live in our gut are dependent on us for life. And there's a symbiotic relationship. We feed them fiber and they feed us essential nutrients such as short chain fatty acids, such as vitamins, and many, many other molecules that not only support our colonic and our gut health, but also signal our brain, also signal our immune system. There's this incredibly complex interrelationship between our gut bacteria and our human cells that we're just beginning to understand. But the most important thing to understand is our gut is only as good as what we feed it. And when we feed it sugar and when we feed it chemicals from processed food, our gut doesn't do so well. Our gut loves natural fiber, both soluble and insoluble from natural products. Let's look at protein. You know, everybody says, oh, I'm going to go on a high protein diet because there's something called thermogenesis. It takes more calories. It takes more energy to break down protein than any of the other macronutrients, i.e. fat or carbohydrates but not all protein is created the same. Protein is different in different forms. Let's take fats. Everybody avoided fats. For 50 years, we were told to avoid fat, right? Because in the calorie is a calorie model, one gram of fat had nine calories over two times what a gram of protein or carbohydrate has. So the thought process was, oh my gosh, don't eat fat because you're eating too many calories. That is absolute silliness because it has nothing to do with calories and it has everything to do with how your body processes that food. So we can eat trans fats, which have been banned from our food supply, yet they still exist in our food supply. So if you read a label, and you see something that's called hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil, put that thing down like it was rat poisoning because that's exactly what it is. Trans fats, our bodies do not have the enzymes to break down trans fats. They get incorporated into our mitochondria. They get incorporated into our cell membranes and they disrupt the normal biologic functioning of cells. So they're not being burned. They're not being broken down. Yet we're told that's nine calories when it's not. Take omega-3 fats. Everybody has heard omega-3 fats, fish oil, DHA, EPA, very healthy, very anti-inflammatory. So our body loves to hoard omega-3 fats. Why? Because they're used in every cell membrane, they're used in our neurons. We don't burn omega-3s, we store omega-3s in our cell membranes and in our neurons. Again, nine calories, of energy, but all of it's stored, none of it's burned. So we got to get rid of this. A calorie is a calorie. And we're going to talk about sugar fairly extensively and why this is so. The next fallacy is this one. Calories in, calories out. Take fewer calories in, exercise more and burn more calories, and you are miraculously going to become thin. 
This model has been perpetuated for the last 50 years and is absolutely false. And you, all you have to do is look at epidemiologic data and it'll tell you it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And why is that? Why doesn't it work? Well, it doesn't work because calories have nothing to do with, ha what, with what happens to us physiologically. Um, you know, the food industry loves this model, right? So eat less, exercise more, and all will be well. It makes no difference where your calories came from. You just have to eat fewer. So now we end up with these little snack packs of Oreos. Instead of being 200 calories, they're now 100 calories. Geez, they're fewer calories. They must be good for you. Complete silliness, nonsense. Food induces hormonal and metabolic responses in the body. So it's not what you eat that's important. It's specifically what your body does what you eat with what you eat. So if you eat an Oreo, that sucker is digested in about a nanosecond. Every bit of that sugar and glucose is immediately shunted to your liver and you start making fat. You start making fat. And then we hear, we'll restrict your calories. Well, guess what? Your body's not stupid. If you start restricting calories, it starts downregulating its metabolic processes. And so you eat fewer calories and it continues to downregulate its metabolic processes and you feel more tired, more lethargic. It's a survival mechanism. It's a survival mechanism. There's this really relatively new concept called the food matrix. And the food matrix is defined in many different ways. Uh, one of the definitions I use is it's the physical domain that contains and or interacts with specific constituents of a food, the nutrients in food, providing functionalities and behaviors that are different from those exhibited by the components in isolation or a free state. And so we are understanding that how natural real food is complex is very different than eating each individual sub-ingredient in that food. So the implication is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And we're figuring this out and it's, you know, we're understanding the truth behind this. So it's again, not the food that's the problem, it's what's done to the food that's the problem. So I always tell people, you know, well, what supplements should I take? And I'm like, you know what? You cannot supplement your way out of a bad diet. And that's really because of this food matrix. The way that vitamins and minerals are complex with complex organic molecules, which, is, which are also complex with fiber and other nutrients within the food, acts so much differently than any of those single ingredients taken alone. And this has real implications for how we should eat. And how we should eat the simplest, if you wanna think of it in a simple term, Eat food as close to its natural state as possible. So anything we do to food, even chopping can change the food matrix. Now that's not to say you shouldn't chop your vegetables and things, but even chopping slightly changes the food matrix. Cooking slightly changes the food matrix. But again, I'm not advocating everything be eaten raw because cooking helps activate enzymes within food and helps with digestion and absorption. But the closer we can eat the food to its natural state, the more nutritious and healthy that food will be. So let's get into metabolic health. And I wanna define metabolic health and I wanna define insulin resistance because these two things, they're completely interrelated and they are absolutely the driver of chronic diseases. And when we can, when we know that, and we, you have to know the problem before you can understand the solution. So that's why I wanna present the problem. And then I wanna help you with the solution. So what is metabolic health? It's the ability of our body to digest and absorb nutrients from the food that we eat without spikes in blood sugar, blood fat, inflammation, and insulin. It's our ability to handle sugar, glucose, okay, any carbohydrate is broken, excuse me, down into glucose, and glucose is an essential fuel for our body, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. It's our ability to handle fat in a normal way so that we're not continuously deposited in our bellies and around our organs and things like that. It's estimated that 88% of adults in this country are metabolically unhealthy. 
So if I measured 100 adults and I measured their insulin levels and I measured their glucose levels and I measured something called hemoglobin A1C and I measured their liver enzymes and I measured their uric acid, 88% of those would be abnormal. That's an astounding number. 50 years ago, that was probably less than 10%. So what is insulin resistance? This is the reduced response to the hormone insulin. And we're gonna talk a lot about insulin because it is really the kingpin hormone of what's driving a lot of our disease. So when we have insulin resistance, we have a decreased response to the insulin molecule. That means our cells, so normally insulin looks like a lock and a key. The lock is on the cell membrane. And when that is locked, glucose or sugar can't get into that cell. Insulin opens the lock, opens the door, and allows glucose to go into that cell and be used for energy and other cellular processes. But when that cell is resistant to insulin because the receptor is locked from a variety of different causes, and we'll talk about those, then it takes more insulin to open that lock and more insulin floating around our blood has very detrimental effects on our health. That's insulin resistance. So what is metabolic syndrome? So we talked about metabolic health. What is metabolic syndrome? This is the inner, it basically is the inappropriate storage of energy in the wrong form, fat, in cells that shouldn't store it, liver, muscles, or any other organ. Metabolic syndrome is intimately associated with insulin resistance. In fact, it is one of the criteria for metabolic syndrome. So when we diagnose someone with metabolic syndrome, we're looking at their waist circumference, we're looking at their blood pressure, we're looking at their blood fats. And one of the criteria is they have to be insulin resistant. And how do we know that? Well, we know that by measuring blood glucose, but a much more accurate way would actually be to measure their insulin levels. So what causes insulin resistance? I think this is really important to understand. If insulin is the problem and we have too much of it, well, what caused that? Well, too much insulin, it has a positive feedback loop. So if we have too much insulin, that perpetuates the cycle. Sugar, sugar, and we're gonna talk a lot about sugar because when I talk about sugar, I've used it in two different ways and I shouldn't have done that. So when I use sugar from here on out, sugar means something like table sugar, okay? The white powdery stuff, then it frankly is more dangerous than cocaine. Sugar comes in multiple forms. So the food industry loves to hide sugar in their labeling. It might be white sugar, it might be natural sugar, it might be raw sugar, it might be brown sugar, it might be molasses, it might be uh, concentrated fruit juice, it might be dextrose, it may be maldextrose. There are about 56 names for sugar. Problem is they all are just as detrimental to us. They're all the same, have the same detriment to our health. And the main molecule in sugar, and we're gonna talk about sugar, is fructose. That's the driver of metabolic syndrome. What else drives insulin resistance? All these processed foods that we're eating, particularly grains. So a grain in its natural state is perfectly fine. A grain that's been processed rapidly is digested, rapidly absorbed, and spikes our insulin. And when we do that day after day and year after year, our body, body can't handle it anymore. We have too little dietary fiber. Fiber is actually the antidote for all of this highly processed, rapidly digested food. It slows digestion. It slows the absorption of these nutrients so that our organs can handle it appropriately. Inflammation, okay? All of these things set up an inflammatory reaction in our body, which is abnormal. And inflammation in and of itself can worsen insulin resistance. There's something called branch chain amino acids. There's three of them, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Um, and so amino acids are structural components of protein. Proteins are made up of amino acids. 
Why are branch chain amino acids so bad? Well, because they're processed through our liver. And the only way to get rid of them is either burn them, but if you're eating lots of them and not burning them, then they're stored as fat. So bodybuilders use branch chain amino acids because the only storage organ for amino acids is our muscle. So if you're building muscle, branch chain amino acids are no big deal. But if you're not building muscle, branch chain amino acids are converted to fat. Guess which plant has the most branch chain amino acids? Corn. Corn is loaded with branch chain amino acids. So as our cows and our pigs and our chickens and every other domesticated animal eats corn, they're storing fat like wild. When you eat that animal, their muscles are loaded with branch chain amino acids. And that's where you get it. Other things unrelated to nutrition or food are unmanaged stress. Cortisol is a driver of insulin resistance. So when we have unmanaged stress, and I don't wanna say every, everyone has had stress, it's just how do we manage it? And I have a whole talk on stress and management of stress and how we can deal with that. Poor sleep, okay? So when we have our disrupted circadian rhythm and we're not sleeping well, that can lead to more insulin resistance. And then gut dysbiosis. And so this is another self-perpetuating cycle. We eat poorly, our gut microbiome is unhealthy. We eat poorly, our gut microbiome gets more unhealthy. That leads to more insulin resistance. That leads to lower disease. That more, leads to more dysbiosis. And it's this never ending cycle. So you can see why our food system is so detrimental. So what are the three functions of insulin? Everybody knows that we need insulin to take glucose from our blood and put it into cells so our cells can use it for energy and all its metabolic processes. But that's not its main function. It actually, its main function is an energy storing hormone. And this from an evolutionary standpoint was really, really helpful. In times of plenty, we wanted to store fat, didn't we? Because there were gonna be lean times in the winter when we were hunter gatherers Spring and summer were the times we could find readily available food. When it came winter, we better have stored up some extra energy or we're going to die. Well, now in our society of 24-7, 365 food, this is an evolutionary disadvantage. And the other thing I want you to pay attention to that insulin is, has a profound effect on is cell growth. Insulin is a pro-growth hormone, and this has really dramatic implications for development of cancer. Insulin and breast cancer, there is a very direct causal relationship between too much insulin and breast cancer risk and survival. That's why I think this is so important for you and your group. I just want you to remember that. You might think, why is he talking about insulin? That is a direct driver of cancer cell growth. So the key to metabolic health is reducing the deposition of fat in all these organs and reducing our circulating insulin. One of my favorite authors, one of my favorite scientists is Robert Lustig. And he has a very simple phrase, protect the liver and feed the gut. We protect the liver by not eating sugar and highly processed foods. We feed the gut by eating lots of fiber. So real food is high in fiber and low in sugar. Processed food is low in fiber and high in sugar. I want you to remember that. So every time you look at a food, does this have what it takes to protect my liver and feed my gut? A very simple, that's why I'm trying to uncomplicate this. Very simple. When you go to the produce section, you don't even have to think about it. Everything in the produce section is high in fiber and low in sugar. That's mother nature. When you start walking the aisles, virtually everything in those, are in those aisles are low in fiber and high in sugar. Helps with shopping. So again, it's not the food itself, it's what's been done to the food. So what does food processing do? Well, number one, it removes the fiber, okay? Removes the fiber. Why do we remove the fiber? Because it increases shelf life. Food in the store is all about shelf life. 
you know, real food spoils. You got to put it in the refrigerator. That stuff on the store shelves, I could sit there for a year and you'd never know it. I mean, they've done, I don't know if any of you have seen on, uh, you know, you, uh, oh, it's been on the internet. Somebody puts out a plate of McDonald's and versus a banana and some oranges and apples. Two days later, the bananas are black. The oranges look terrible. The animal or the apples are beginning to brown. Yet three weeks later, that McDonald's meal looks like you just pulled it out of the package. It's all about shelf life. What else happens with processed food? We add sugar to it. Okay, there are 600,000 plus items in the grocery store and about 75% of them have added sugar. Sugar where mother nature never intended it to be. And then we have all these other things, flavor enhancers. Okay, these are chemicals. These are chemicals that disrupt our hormone signaling. Yes, they're considered generally safe, but they're not. And then we have this thing called trans fats. Think Crisco. You know, that's supposed to be taken out of our food system, but it's really not. Any packaged food, if it has less than 0.5 grams of trans fats, does not have to put that on the label. So when you look at the packaging ingredients and you see hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated oil, that has trans fats. And these are deadly. We've shown this for decades. Artificial sweeteners. So a lot of foods have now, a lot of food companies have recognized hmm, we better take the sugar out, that's detrimental health. Now we're gonna put all these artificial sweeteners in. Not so good, let's slow down on that. So for example, the um, chemically manufactured artificial sweeteners such as sucralose, such as um, Equal, which is aspartame, they are known to be gut disruptors. In fact, there was a study out of Duke a couple of years ago and it took one package, one package of Splenda and Splenda is sucrose basically with a chlorine molecule added to it. And when the person ate one package of Splenda, it killed about half of their good gut bacteria. So we've got to be careful with artificial sweeteners. And then there's these things called emulsifiers, guar gum and all these other things. They also are detrimental to our gut microbiome. So let's look at these two nutrition labels because nutrition labels only tell us what is chemically in that food. It doesn't tell us what's been done to that food. So look at these two labels, they're very, very similar. And you pick that up and say, well, that looks pretty healthy. You know, it's got four grams of fiber, so it's got some fiber. It's got a little sugar in each one, it's got a little protein. One of these is a whole food, one of these is wheat flour. So let's figure out which one. You can't. You couldn't tell me which one of these is wheat berries, the whole wheat, and which one of these is flour. Actually, the one on the, um, the uh, right is, is flour. The one on the left is wheat berries. The flour will be immediately absorbed from your gut, and it will give this overwhelming load of glucose to your liver, to your muscles, and if you have too much glucose entering your liver at once, some of that's going to be converted to fat. Whereas the wheat berry is the whole thing. It's got the fiber on the outside, the endosperm in the middle, and the germ on the inside. That fiber slows the absorption. Very easy for our body to handle. So nutrition labels tell you nothing about what's been done to the food. I like, I kind of talked about this, or I kind of thought about this. Sugar. Sorry, we got to talk about it. Because if you can do one thing, and we're going to talk about, you know, how do I do all this? It seems overwhelming. If you can do one thing in your nutritional life, it's get rid of as much sugar from your diet as is humanly possible. And when I say get rid of sugar, that means added sugar. That does not mean the sugar found in fruit. That does not mean the sugar found in vegetables. That means the sugar that the food industry is adding to your food. And many of you, you know, we don't even know it. We don't even know it. So let me define what I, when I talk about sugar, what that means. That means sucrose. Sucrose is white table sugar. Sucrose is what's found in honey. Sucrose is what's found in agave. Sucrose is what's found in uh, maple syrup. 
what's found in monk fruit, all these different things. It has two molecules, so it's called a disaccharide. Two molecules, one molecule of glucose. Glucose is essential for life. In fact, it's so essential if we don't ingest it, we make it through a process called gluconeogenesis in the liver. And it also has one molecule of what's called fructose. Fructose, there is no biochemical reaction in our body that, re that uh, requires fructose. Fructose in high doses is a chronic poison, okay? Just remember that. When you look at how fructose is metabolized in the liver, it's metabolized exactly as alcohol. So every time you drink a Coke, you're doing the same thing to your liver as if you drank a beer. The only difference is you don't get a buzz with the Coke and you do with the beer. Fructose, chronic consumption leads to fatty liver, high blood pressure, high blood fats, insulin resistance, as we talked about, and inflammation. So if you go back 100 years, we're eating about five grams of fructose a day. No problem. Body can easily handle it. Liver knows exactly what to do with it. Now today, some people are eating up to 70 grams of fructose a day, and most of it's coming from sugary beverages. Our liver has no idea what to do with that amount of fructose. So again, the poison is in the dose. Dr. Nish, overdose. We we did have a question. Um, somebody said, I use date sugar, ground up dates when cooking and baking. Is that healthy uh -huh. or not? It's still sugar. So is it better? Well, maybe because there's a little bit of fiber with the dates, um, but it's still sugar. And so I think you have to count that as, oh, instead of using table sugar, I'm using date sugar, still sugar. Um, you know, we have been in, the food industry has addicted us to sugar. And there is true addiction to sugar in about 20% of people. But we all love sugar. And so we try and nuance it and say, well, I'm going to use ground up dates, or I'm going to use honey, that's natural, or I'm going to use maple syrup. The thing is, we just got to wean ourselves off from all the sugar. So if my wife and I make a recipe, um, we will typically, in most cases, if it calls for sugar, we will cut that sugar by a half to three quarters. And so we've really become uh, very uh, tolerant of non-sweet things. And when we get something sweet, it tastes awful to us. So dates are, yes, probably better than adding sugar, but boy, we just need to cut back on even those things. In fact, when you look at, you know, I don't really recommend too much dried fruit because dried fruit really concentrates the sugar. So thanks for bringing that point up. So can I just ask a follow-up question to that? When you, you were talking about the produce and how all of that is, is healthy because it's in its most natural state, like with the berries and stuff, pineapple, bananas that tend to have more natural sugar, is, is that okay? Or is that something that you still want to limit how much of that natural sugar that you have? Yeah, you know, I didn't want to nuance this talk too much because I wanted to drive home the big point. But yeah, we can nuance that even more. And we can say, okay, if you really are metabolically dis... And when I work with people who are completely metabolically dysregulated, I'm pretty strict, okay? You're not eating bananas, you're not eating pineapples, you're not eating papayas. Uh, berries are the lowest in sugar. Kiwis are quite good. Watermelon, interestingly, has a gly high glycemic index. It's got a lot of sugar, but there's not much volume to it. So yes, we can nuance that. And yes, we can stay away from the tropical fruits. We can stick more towards the less sweet fruits. Uh, citrus is okay. Grapefruits are okay. Apples, we gotta be careful with apples. Apples have been bred in this country to be sweet. Honey, honey crisp, right? They've been bred with more sugar. So if we're talking apples, let's stick to the older varieties, the Granny Smiths, the Macintosh, the Jonathans. They're just less sweet. So yeah, we can nuance fruit. No, no question about it. Did you say berries is okay? Yes. Raspberries? Raspberries okay. are wonderful. Strawberries are wonderful. Blueberries are a little higher in sugar, but still fine. Blue, blackberries are wonderful. Um, if you're lucky enough to go out and pick wild berries, uh, those are wonderful. 
So berries are uh, from a fruit aspect are the lowest in the sort of fructose content. But remember, all fruit has fructose in it. But here's the difference. The fructose in fruit is complexed with fiber. And guess what? That fiber slows the absorption so our liver knows exactly what to do with it. So an analogy I've used in the past is, if you drink a soda pop, that is like hooking up a fructose fire hose to your liver. <laughs> and your liver has no idea what to do with it. All it can do is make fat. If you eat any fruit, that fruit, fructose in the fruit is complex with fiber. And it's like sipping that fiber into your liver through a cocktail straw. Little bits, no problem. Liver knows what to do with it, can burn it for fuel, isn't going to make fat. So fructose is driving metabolic syndrome. It's driving our abnormal waist circumference. It's driving our high blood pressure. It's driving our high blood fats. It's driving our low HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, and it's driving insulin resistance. And what's the main source of fructose in our society? Sugary beverages. 45% of our fructose load in our society comes from sugary beverages. So what are you gonna do? What's the number one thing you're gonna do to get rid of fructose? Rethink your drink. I did a whole project a few years ago. We had a, we had a challenge, a rethink your drink challenge. And the winner actually got off of five 20 ounce Mountain Dews a day. So other sources, processed foods. 75% of our foods had added sugar, which is just ridiculous. But the food industry has no interest in your health. It has no interest in your nutrition. The only interest of the food industry is sell you more food. And in order to do that, they want to make it taste so good that you keep coming back for more, whether you're full or not. Oh, that chocolate cake is so good. Bam, there it goes. So what's the recommendation for added sugar per day? And I'm going to use the WHO, the World Health Organization, recommends no more than six teaspoons of added sugar per day. That's 24 grams. So let's put that into context. An eight ounce glass of orange juice has 18 grams of sugar. And I don't care if it's been added or not, it's 18 grams of sugar. Because how, how many oranges does it take to make eight, eight ounces of orange juice? Hmm, four to six oranges. So you're now squeezing the juice and the fructose out of four to six oranges and rapidly drinking that down in a cup. Now, if you drank that glass of juice over three or four hours, yeah, you'd be fine. Your body can handle that fructose load, but nobody drinks a cup of orange juice over three or four hours. We slam that sucker down in five minutes and away we go. Let's look at a Coca-Cola. Let's look at a 12 ounce Coca-Cola. How many grams of sugar does a 12 ounce Coca-Cola have? 39 grams of sugar in a 12 ounce Coca-Cola. That's over, that's almost two days worth of sugar in a single beverage. Now, here's the problem with Cokes and Mountain Dews. They don't own, not just have sugar, they're loaded with caffeine and they're loaded with salt. So when you drink a Coca-Cola, that salt is causing your body to feel like it's dehydrated. It's not quenching your thirst. It's making you thirstier. So you come back for more. The sugar, it's telling our brain. It's signaling what's called the hedonic pathway in our brain. That hedonic pathway says, oh, that was so good. That's our pleasure center. I want more of that. And bam, we're hooked. A 20 ounce Mountain Dew. You see these kids drinking Mountain Dew all day long. It has 73 grams of sugar. And don't be fooled. Sports drinks loaded with sugar. Energy drinks loaded with sugar. All these quote juices, naked juices, right? Naked juice. It's got all this great juice in it. It's just sugar. It's 56 grams of sugar. 
do not drink your food. I have that later in the talk. While you're switching slides, um, somebody did ask, "What's your view on organic food?" Um, can I do? Can I answer that at the end? Absolutely. Okay, but I knew that was going to come up, and I do want to answer that, um, and I want to be very um, sensitive to people's economic situations, and so we are going to talk about organic versus conventional food. Sounds good. So you've probably all heard, or you probably all think, and we've always been taught is that obesity drives metabolic syndrome. It's not. Obesity is just a symptom of metabolic syndrome, just as high blood pressure is a symptom of metabolic syndrome, just as heart disease is a symptom of metabolic syndrome. So when we treat obesity or what we think we treat obesity with bariatric surgery, we're treating the symptoms. We're not treating the underlying cause. When we treat a heart attack with statin drugs and blood pressure drugs and blood thinner drugs, we're treating the symptoms. We're not treating the underlying cause. So we all equate obesity and metabolic syndrome. And about 80% of obese people do have metabolic dysregulation. But here's the real kicker. About 40% of normal weight people are metabolically ill. We call them the skinny fat or fat thin on the outside, fat on the inside. So you, and that's what's happening with teenagers. These teenagers are drinking Mountain Dew. They're still skinny, but if they continue, they won't be. And a lot of those are probably metabolically dysregulated. So this is so important. It's the driver of our chronic diseases. So as we talked about, insulin lowers blood sugar, signals our body to store energy, and it stimulates cell growth. So if you chronically have high insulin levels, there is virtually no way you can lose weight because insulin is telling us physiologically that our cells are starving and we need to store more energy. And we, I didn't want to get into the biochemistry. That's very, very complex. But just suffice it to say, if you have high insulin levels, you are being told to store energy and conserve energy. That's why a lot of us have no energy during the day. Our insulin is not only telling us to conserve or to store calories, it's also telling us to conserve calories. Yeah, high insulin. The other thing insulin does is it locks up a uh, enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase. And hormone-sensitive lipase is an enzyme or a hormone that allows us to release our fat stores for energy burning. But guess what inhibits that enzyme? Insulin. So now insulin locks up our lipoprotein or our, um, our uh, hormone-sensitive lipase, and now we can't mobilize fat stores for energy. The other thing, insulin drives cell growth. I've got a whole talk about that. You know, how does it drive cell growth and what's its relationship to cancer? But I think for this talk, it's important. Insulin drives cell growth and abnormal cell growth at that. So this is the hyperinsulinemia and ca cancer risk model. So we become insulin resistant. It leads to hyperinsulinemia, too much insulin. And too much insulin leads to an increase in the enzyme aromatase. And so many of you might be on an aromatase inhibitor. And what aromatase does, is it converts androgens, male hormones, which we all have, to estrogen. Well, if you have an estrogen positive, receptor positive cancer, we want to lower your estrogen as much as possible. So we give you an aromatase inhibitor. Well, insulin drives aromatase, therefore it drives the production of estrogen. Insulin also reduces what's called um, sex hormone binding globulin. So what that is, it's a protein that binds sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and does not allow those sex hormones to offload and influence tissue. But if it reduces sex hormone binding globulin, we have more free estrogen, 
that promotes the growth of cancer cells. So that's the model for hyperinsulinemia and cancer risk. And it's per particularly prominent in breast cancer. So lifestyle factors associated with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, a review, okay? I think this is so important, we're gonna hit it again. Processed foods, simple carbohydrates. The more processed the food, the quicker it's metabolized, the higher the insulin levels. And we know that there's a causal relationship between the degree of food processing and the risk of cancer. Sugar, fructose, we've been over this. Drives hyperinsulinemia, drives metabolic syndrome. We also know there's a direct correlation between the amount of sugar that's consumed and the risk of cancer. Continuous caloric intake. Okay, we're going to talk about, you know, we like to talk about what foods to eat, but I'm also going to get into how we should eat. When should we eat? And in our society, we eat, the average person eats 16 hours a day, when in reality, we ought to be fasting 16 hours a day. So we're constantly taking in food. When we constantly take in food, particularly carbohydrates, our insulin levels are constantly high. We got to bring our insulin levels down. When you're not eating, that's how you bring your insulin levels down. Trans fats, we've talked about those. Excessive alcohol, there's again a direct link between alcohol consumption and breast cancer. Too much protein. You know, we, we've kind of gone wild on protein. We live in a society where there's plenty of protein available in our food supply. We don't need extra protein. We don't need protein shakes for the most part. Okay, some people who are undergoing cancer treatment, particularly GI cancers, we do have to supplement protein, but for the average person, we get plenty of protein. Lack of movement. We don't move as a society. We're too sedentary. We need to move. We have poor sleep patterns, right? We got screens on all the time. The room isn't dark. We're distracted. We need to sleep better. And then we learn, have to learn how to manage stress because all of these contribute to insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So I'm gonna go back to Dr. Lustig. When you're looking at buying food, I want you to remember, how do I protect my liver? So, oh, I better figure out how processed this food is, how much sugar this food is, has, or better still, never exit the produce section. Yeah, you can go to the dairy section, pick up your eggs, pick up, you know, a dairy, your yogurt, non-sweetened, plain yogurt, go to the meat counter and get a nice piece of grass-fed meat or a nice piece of fish. Do not go down the aisles though. Yeah, toilet paper's okay, paper towels, no problem. But you really wanna remember whole, real food, high in fiber, low in sugar, and it does both. It protects your liver and feeds your gut. Processed food does just the opposite. It promotes neither, and it promotes, or it does neither, and it promotes disease. So I, 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 I'm not giving you a list of foods to eat, okay? I'm gonna let you figure that out based on your ethnic preferences, your taste preferences. You know, if you don't like mushrooms, I'm probably not gonna get you to eat mushrooms. If you don't like avocados, well, maybe that's not the best choice, but there's thousands of others. But it's really the eating pattern that's more important than any individual food. And again, marketers have marketed superfoods, right? We have a new superfood every week. I'm here to tell you, every fruit and every vegetable is a superfood because they all have inherent properties that are unique to that food. And what we have really learned in the last few years is in order to feed our gut, in order to promote a healthy gut bacterial microbiome. It's not necessarily that we just eat fiber. It's the diversity with which that fiber comes. So we want to eat the most diverse diet possible. So vegetables are not corn and beans, okay? If you just eat corn and beans, you're not doing your gut any favors. We have to eat the widest variety possible. And that's become so important. So I would challenge each one of you, if you really get into this, eat 20 or 30 to 50 different plant foods each week. What's a plant food? It's a vegetable, 
it's a fruit, it's a seed, it's a nut, it's a grain, it's a spice, okay? It can be any of those things. The more variety, every one of these foods, and you'll notice the subliminal messaging on the left of the screen, right? Every one of those is a different color. Every color of the rainbow has different, what we call phytochemicals, polyphenols. There's thousands of these chemicals that our gut bacteria love, that our body loves, that enhances our cellular, our cellular health, it enhances our mitochondria, our little energy powerhouses to produce more energy. So we want a wide variety. So an eating pattern of whole vegetables, fruits, seeds and nuts. I love seeds and nuts. Nuts are incredibly healthy. Seeds are incredibly healthy. They have phytochemicals, they have fiber, they have minerals such as manganese, selenium, magnesium, zinc, things we don't get enough of in our diet. Use herbs and spices liberally. They all have really different chemical properties that enhance our health. Uh, fermented foods, a wonderful addition to our diet. And it may not be from the probiotics in fermented foods. It may actually be some of the acids in the fermented foods that are actually helping out with our metabolic health. Grass-fed meat. I'm very particular about meat. I am not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. I eat small amounts of meat, three to four ounces a day, but I'm especially particular where my meat comes from. I want grass-fed meat. I do not want farm or I do not want factory raised meat because why? It's fed the same junk that's making us fat, corn, all these grains, pasture raised poultry, wild caught fish, eggs. Eggs are a wonderful source of not only protein, but also omega-3 fats. They're a source of vitamin D, one of the few food sources of vitamin D. They're a source of vitamin A. They're a source of, which is the carotenoids. That's why it's yellow. Eggs are wonderful and they're very inexpensive. But if you're going to buy eggs, be very picky and pay more for pasture local raised eggs. Chocolate. Dark chocolate is actually a wonderful uh, uh, um, treat because it has many of these polyphenols but here's the key for dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is not a Hershey bar. Dark chocolate is anything over 70 to 75% cacao. You have to get used to it. Uh, the only chocolate I'll eat is 90% now. Love it. When I eat something that's less than 90%, it tastes like wax. And then the occasional whole grain and legumes. I, I really struggle with whole grains because frankly, there is no definition. There is no nutritional definition in our society of a whole grain. You can call it whole grain bread if you started out with whole grains. So we have very few actual whole grains in the grocery store. You can buy wheat berries, which are you know whole wheat kernels. You can buy oats, uh, steel cutter, the closest, but groats, groats are actually whole oats, but you have to really search those out. So whole grains, occasionally legumes, occasionally. Pretty starchy. Beverages. Oh, oh sorry. go ahead. I was Let just going to say, we had a couple of questions come in. One was about if you have an ER negative, PR negative breast cancer, um, how does that influence what you should eat? And then also, do you recommend a probiotic? So it does not change what I say to eat. It's just that yours is not hormone receptor positive. So therefore, any estrogen stimulation is not going to affect the cancer, but certainly the hyperinsulinemia will. So no change in that recommendation. And I do not recommend probiotics. And I'll tell you why. We're too early in our research to understand what probiotics are actually doing. And there is really very little evidence that these probiotics we're swallowing are repopulating our gut or even making it to our gut through the stomach acid. So don't waste your money on probiotics. They're expensive. And I think that, again, the marketing is way ahead of the research. There may be uh, specific instances where probiotics might help, specifically if you're taking antibiotics or some chemotherapies, there's some very interesting data on using some probiotics with chemotherapy, um, but we're very early in that. So a probiotic is a general, oh, take it once a day and everything will be okay. Not so much. Water, preferably filtered. Okay, we live in Iowa. Unfortunately, our waterways are contaminated with nitrates. And 
even though we're within EPA levels, my opinion, we're too high and we should filter our water. Um, tea and coffee. Now you can, you, you can nuance water. You can have sparkling water. You can, you can flavor your water with natural flavors such as squeeze a lemon, squeeze a lime, soak it in strawberries, soak it in fruit to enhance that flavor. But please try and avoid all these uh, flavor enhancers with artificial sweeteners. Um, the latest research on artificial sweeteners suggests that many of them are worse at promoting metabolic dysregulation than sugar. So please try and stay away from those. There are a couple. There's a new one out called allulose. Allulose seems to be pretty safe. Stevia, if you need to use an artificial sweetener, is, seems to be pretty safe. But when you start looking at the chemical artificial sweeteners, like the, you know, the uh, equal, which is uh, aspartame and those, saccharin, stay away from it. And then the other thing I caution people on, don't drink your food, okay? Again, that goes back to the premise, eat the food as close to nature as possible. Everybody wants to juice. Juicing is taking all the sugar, drinking it in one setting and leaving all the fiber behind. Juicing is a bad idea. And then we love smoothies, right? We wanna grind all this stuff up. That's okay, but most people are grinding up very sweet fruits. What do we put in smoothies? Bananas, pineapple, mangoes, really sweet fruit. And when we grind those, we're really disrupting the complexity of the fiber within those fruits. And so we don't have the soluble and insoluble fiber working the way they should. So I do, I'm not a juice, juicing, do not juice. And I'm not a smoothie fan either. Now, if you have swallowing difficulties, you have to take things as liquid. Okay, I can, get, I can go with a smoothie, but try and not make it super sweet. Alcohol, limit consumption, preferably none. Okay, alcohol is a neurotoxin. Alcohol is not good for our brain. There is no real advantage of alcohol in our body. Some would argue that, well, wed wine has this antioxidant called, called resveratrol. Well, a glass of wine is not gonna jack your resveratrol to, to anywhere near what you need to influence your health. Limit and stay away from alcohol. Let's look at when to eat. Like I said, most of us eat 16 hours a day and we should be doing just the opposite, okay? Uh, probably many of you have heard about fasting and you can fast, you know, you can fast for 24 hours and then eat the next day. I'm a big fan of what's called time-restricted eating. So my eating window is about six to eight hours. I don't eat my first meal till noon. I eat my last meal between six and seven o'clock. That gives me 16 to 18 hours where I am not actively taking in food and my insulin levels are low. Now, how do I go about doing this? How do you begin to time restrict eat? Well, most of you, you know, we have to be what's called metabolically flexible, meaning we have to be able to use ketones as fuel as well as glucose. Well, if we're so glucose dependent because we're hyperinsulinemic, it's gonna be hard to use ketones and you won't feel well. So it's a gradual process. So what I tell people is first week, if you normally eat breakfast at eight o'clock, Okay, first week, go, start at nine o'clock. Second week, go to 10 o'clock. Third week, go to 11 o'clock till you can get to a point where your eating window is eight hours or less. There's actually some really nice data in women with breast cancer. If they can fast more than 13 hours, and there was a really interesting, there's a cutoff at 13 hours, uh, they have better outcomes. So fasting can be a profoundly healing and uh, welcome tool to add to our sort of metabolic dysregulation. And one of the things I would caution all of you against is no late night snacks. That is probably one of the metabolically, one of the worst things we can do. We should finish our last meal at least three hours before we go to bed. Exercise. So this is the calories in, calories out. Exercise, I will just tell you, is not an effective weight loss tool. Okay. You cannot exercise your way out of a bad diet. You cannot exercise your way out of being overweight. Doesn't work. What exercise is great for is it improves the sensitivity of our muscles to use, to um, um, 
sense insulin. So it increases our insulin sensitivity and therefore it improves our ability to use glucose and it can improve our insulin levels. So take a walk, 30 to 45 minutes, particularly after dinner, particularly after dinner. We want to avoid long periods of sitting. And this has been really interesting topic. Is there a difference between lack of exercise and sitting? Then there absolutely is. The longer we sit, the more metabolically dysregulated we become. So if you're sitting at a desk eight hours a day, you need to get out of that chair every 45 to 60 minutes and take three minutes and walk around, do squats, do some sort of exercise to stimulate muscle contraction. And it's really about consistency. So, you know, the recommended, if you look at the, you know, American Sports Association, they recommend 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. Well, if I did that 150 minutes on a Saturday and did nothing the rest of the week, that is a virtually no use. It's about consistency. It's about every day getting outside and walking, running, swimming, biking, gardening, playing with your kids, whatever it is, every day for at least 20 to 30 minutes. We can all do that. And you can break it up. So, you know, I look at how do I incorporate movement into my life? Well, when I go to the mall, I park as far away from the door as possible. That's a five minute walk into the mall. I never go to the mall, so I don't really know. Um, if you're in a high a building with uh, elevators, take the stairs. We can incorporate movement into our everyday life in many, many ways. Cook, guess what? When we cook, we move, we lift, we squat, we walk, we move around, we use our arms, we use our legs. Cooking is physical movement. I have a then, question. I'm sorry. Oh. I have a quick question. What do you and your family eat for breakfast and dinner? <laughs> um, so, you know, with my time restricted eating, my breakfast is around 1130. Um, I get up at 630. I don't eat till 1130. Uh, we make something and I'll share this recipe with Gabby. I know I'm supposed to do a, I'm supposed to do a little newsletter thing and I'm going to share this recipe. It's called adventure bread. An adventure bread is not a bread as you think of a bread. Uh, a loaf of adventure bread weighs four pounds. And it, is, it consists of seeds and nuts and a little bit of oats. So it's flax seed, sesame seed, chia seed, hemp seed, um, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, walnuts, almonds, a little bit of oats. And that's what I eat every day. Two slices of adventure bread, one with avocado, and pea shoots or broccoli shoots or some type of shoots and arugula. And the other one, I have a little almond butter and a small amount of apricot jam. And then uh, I usually kind of eat my lunch in two stages. I will then have two eggs and typically two or three vegetables with that egg. So I'll saute onions, I'll saute asparagus, I'll saute spinach almost every day. Um, Truly, I get in two servings of greens every day, whether it's spinach, chard, kale. Um, this coming up, we know with the spring coming up, we'll eat lots of beet greens. Uh, so we always incorporate greens. For dinner, our dinner is typically, and this could be in a variety of different ways. We'll cook Indian, we'll cook Asian, we'll cook you know, American, but we'll have a small piece of lean protein. So it might be a small three ounce piece of grass fed steak, might be three or four ounces of fish might be three or four ounces of poultry. Um, and with that, we'll have a salad, okay? And that salad will typically be uh, fresh greens, including things like arugula um, and lettuce. And then we'll have four or five chopped vegetables in there. So we'll have radishes, we'll have peppers, we'll have carrots, we'll have fennel. Uh, and we'll then add seeds or nuts. So we'll have toasted walnuts, toasted almonds, pumpkin seeds. Uh, we'll top it off with a homemade vinaigrette dressing. And a lot of times we'll throw a little bit of fruit in there as well. We'll also have two to three vegetables on our plate. So we'll always, almost always have a greens. And then we'll have this time of year, we have a lot of asparagus. Uh, we'll have grilled onions. Uh, we, do, we do this mix of grilled vegetables. So we'll find all these vegetables and grill them. Uh, so it's always three servings of vegetables, a huge salad, a lean protein. And that's sort of how we eat. 
Uh, rarely, you know, we'll have some wild rice once in a while. Uh, we'll have sweet potatoes once in a while. Sweet potatoes are okay. Uh, just remember the longer you cook them, the more sugary they become. So we don't wanna cook them, overcook those. Um, we rarely have white potatoes. Sometimes we do. We'll do a mash where we'll mix rutabaga, cauliflower, and a couple white potatoes for a kind of a root vegetable mash. Um, but yeah, those are the themes we do. It's just really all about how do I get how do I get as many vegetables on my plate as possible and avoid starchy, high carbohydrate foods. So how do you do all this? Well let me tell you, you got to change your food environment and you have control over your home food environment. Many times we don't have control over our work food environment, except for the 30 years that I worked at the hospital, I brought my own meal every day for lunch. And typically it was leftovers from the night before. But if in order to eat like this at home, you have got to clean out the junk because if those chips are sitting in the cupboard, guess what you're going to eat? chips, right? Can't, can't live without them. So you cannot have those in your home. You're unlikely to crave chips and say, well, I'm going to get in the car and go to the store and buy chips. Pretty unlikely. But if you crave chips and it's right there in the cupboard, you're going to eat it. So we really, really need to change our home food environment. And as I tell people, you should have one cupboard and that cupboard will house, you know, a few nuts, maybe some oils that you might use for cooking, but you should have two refrigerators because everything you eat should spoil. And it's a transition, but the number one thing I recommend is you've got to get the sweet junk foods, highly processed foods out of the house. Okay. You just, you, you have to, you cannot do this if you can't, you don't do that. Um, food prep. So I work with some of the residents at the hospital and they're busy. And I said, you know, the best way to do this is prepare, cut up a whole bunch of vegetables and fruit on Sunday, package that up in sealable containers, and then it's ready to go for the week. You can also go to hy V and buy stuff pre-chopped. No problem with that. <clears throat> so it really is about food prep, about having the foods in the house. When you have a fridge full of vegetables, it's easy. Oh yeah, I got this, this, and this. We, and unfortunately, I'm not a big menu planner. <clears throat> Neither my wife or I are big menu planners. We just eat what's in the fridge. Um, and it makes it really easy. And we'll combine all kinds of things all the time. Um, so meal prep, you know, prep. If you want to plan a menu, I've got some uh, things at the end. I've got some cookbooks at the end that uh, I think are really great for meal planning. Uh, one's called The Cancer Fighting Kitchen. One is called Clean Soups. And the other one is um, um, the doctor's kitchen. Here's what I really want to emphasize, though. You've now listened to me talk about all of this stuff, your head spinning, and you feel overwhelmed. So this is my charge to you. Look at your eating habits and look at one thing this week that you can do to improve your food supply or how you eat, okay? If you're a sugary beverage drinker, can I get rid of one sugary beverage, okay? If you're a chip eater, can I get rid of chips? Find one thing that you can do that you can achieve consistently over time because consistent small changes over time lead to big changes in health and well-being. You can't do this all at once. You, it took you years to get here. It's going to take years to get out of it. But I, I'm giving you the formula. Small, consistent changes. So maybe it's, oh, I'm not going to eat my breakfast till nine o'clock. Great. Do that for a week. If you've accomplished that and you feel good, the next week, what can I do next? So it's all about looking at your life and how you can change given these basic principles of what's going on in your metabolic health. Bring your family for the journey. I think this is so important because nobody wants to cook six meals for everybody, right? Bring your family along, particularly if you have little kids, they're the best. They'll try things, they'll experiment. Bring your family through into this journey. 
explain to them why you're doing these changes. I think that can be so powerful. So yeah, bring the family along, bring the family along. These are just some um, resources that I've put in, just a few. Uh, Metabolical, this is my favorite guy, Robert Lustig, great book. Um, there's a really nice website that talks, it's for cancer, it's basically cancer specific, really has a nice part on nutrition. Uh, there's, if you really get into this, there's a monograph called Diet, Nutrition, Physical Activity and Cancer, a Global Perspective. This is a massive amount of material in there. And then I've got a few cookbooks that, you know, you can take a look at if you wish. And I'm going to go back to the question of organic versus conventional, because I wasn't going to forget about that. So this is a raging debate. You know, the conventional farmers will say there's not that much pesticides on our food. Our foods are just as nutritious or as organic, and it doesn't make any difference. The organic people will say our food is more nutritious. It's grown more wholesomely. There's less pesticides on it. So it's debate. There's a lot of debate on this. How much pesticide is too much pesticide? That's a really interesting question. So here's my take on it. Um, it really depends on, on your economic situation. If your economic situation allows you to buy organic foods without undue distress on your budget, buy organic foods. Now, there's a, many of you may, may have heard the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. And they have a list, the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. So the Dirty Dozen are the dozen most pesticide-laden foods. Strawberries are number one, spinach is number two. It's been that way for years. And then there's the Clean 15. Those are foods, eh, probably doesn't make any difference whether you buy conventional or organic. There's not high levels of pesticides. That's one resource. Now, if your budget does not allow organic purchasing, buy all the produce you want. Spend your money on produce. If you're limited, spend it on conventional produce. Now, there's really a neat way that you do, the Environmental Working Group also has a whole monograph on how to shop economically for these foods. And so, you know, stores always have sales, right? You get the little flyer and, oh, I got apples at 99 cents a pound or I've got X, Y, and Z, buy things on sale. So, you know, we have this, this conception that buying real food is so much more expensive than buying processed food. And I would take argument with that. Um, you know, I calculated that once. My wife and I had, uh, you know, six ounces of salmon split between us. We had three vegetables and a salad. And that meal cost us about $16. Well, you go to McDonald's and you buy a big hamburger and French fries and a drink, and that's, you're going to spend five and a half bucks, maybe six bucks. And all you're doing is poisoning yourself. So we, we really have to get over this calorie thing. We really have to get over, you know, calories in, calories out. And we really need to focus on, is this good for my liver? Is it protecting my metabolic processes in my liver? And is it feeding my gut? And that's the bottom line. Gabby, were there other questions? We had one more question, and that was um, your advice on cheese. Oh, that's a really interesting, uh, another really interesting debate. Um, you know, a large part of our population, particularly the Asian population, is lactose intolerant, meaning they don't have the enzyme to, to uh, digest lactose, which is milk sugar. Now, if you buy real cheese, Okay, so let, let's go back and qualify what cheese is first. Okay, if it comes in a can, if it comes in a spray bottle, or it's wrapped in individual cellophane, that's not cheese. Okay, that's processed cheese like stuff. So real cheese has, comes in a wheel, has to be cut from that wheel, um, and is fermented. Now, lots of debate on casein proteins and how they can be disruptors in our gut microbiome and our gut health. Many of us do not do well with what's called casein um, A1 protein. And that's from conventional cows, okay? Conventional cows fed conventional corn, a lot of people don't do well with. 
there's been a lot of argument that casein A2 cheese, which comes from, I can never remember if those are Jersey cows and the other are Guernsey or it's the other way around, but there's casein A2 protein cheese, which could be better for people. But what we're really finding is that sheep and goat cheese may be better than either of those. So cheese is very nuanced. Where do you source your cheese? The best source of cheese, frankly, is sheep or goat's cheese that's raised in alpine meadows. And the reason is those sheep and goats are feeding on lots of herbs and different types of plants. So you have to remember with animal products, we are ingesting what those animals ate. So if those animals are eating corn, that's what we're ingesting basically is corn. If those animals are eating a wide variety of wild plant materials, including herbs, that's what we're ingesting. I have no problem with small amounts of cheese. Um, there's actually pretty good evidence that there's something called conjugated linolenic acid, which is actually cardioprotective and may be metabolically protective, but you have to buy real cheese and not cellophane wrap, cheese whiz, Velveeta, squirt it on and eat it. So I'm okay with small amounts of cheese. And any recommendations on what to eat if you're allergic to tree nuts? Yeah. Um, I go more to seeds then. Seeds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we have to, you know, we have to be very uh, sensitive to people's allergies. And if you are allergic to tree nuts, then you obviously have to avoid those. Uh, but there are many different uh, great properties in seeds. So I look towards seeds as being, you know, great to sprinkle on salads, great to eat a handful. I eat a handful of pumpkin seeds, you know, eat a handful of pumpkin seeds and I get 45% of my daily magnesium level or amount that I need. So seeds can be a really great uh, addition to diet. And most people don't eat many seeds, uh, flax seeds, particularly. So flax seeds are very high in uh, linolenic acid, which is an omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, the one thing you have to remember about flax seeds is you can't eat the whole seed, you have to grind them. Um, the other thing I wanna mention about seeds and nuts is they're very rich in polyunsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats are very sensitive to degradation in warm temperature and sunlight. So the best way to keep your seeds and nuts is keep them in the fridge if you're gonna use them within a month or keep them in the freezer if they're going to sit around as long as three to four months. Okay. Um, I agree with Adele, who put in a comment that this is so wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, she is the cheerleader of our group, but she is completely right. Uh, this has been, I took up two pages of notes. So um, <laughs> I, think, I think it was fantastic. And I look forward to uh, your uh, article in our next newsletter as well. Oh yeah. Well, when does that do much. again? Yeah. <laughs> You're I, I believe it's June 1st, but I will check with um, okay. our I'm gonna newsletter write that guru. Down. Yep. But I, I was going to send you a follow-up email on that. I am going to stop recording. Um,